Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel. Secretary, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan. <laughs> Mayor, City of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu. And our moderator, chair, and counselor, Center for American Progress, John D. Podesta. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And we've had some wonderful uh, uh, dialogues between people from the private sector and people from government uh, in these dynamic duo sessions uh, in our plenaries. Uh, but there are also effective partnerships between different levels of government, and we have a great example uh, of that here today that are really critical uh, for long-term economic success. Secretary Donovan and his partners at HUD have joined Mayor Landrieu's efforts to revitalize and, and rebuild New Orleans' Treme neighborhood and Iber Iberville uh, housing development through a large choice neighborhood grant that was one of five big grants that HUD uh, did last fall. And uh, we're gonna talk about that partnership uh, th this afternoon, but I wanna start by turning uh, to Mayor Landrieu and asking him, for those people here who might not have HBO, <laughs> could, you, <laughs> could you describe uh, that, uh, the Treme neighborhood? What's, what, what's the Iberville housing development project look like? How long has it been? Oh, well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Mr. Secretary. It's great to be with you. Um, well, if anybody has, a, has kind of a spatial awareness of the city of New Orleans, besides being the most fabulous city in the world, um, this particular neighborhood that we're talking about is immediately adjacent to the French Quarter uh, in downtown New Orleans. Arboville is the name of uh, what historically we've been known as America as, you know, a high-rise, dense uh, project. Uh, it's a neighborhood where people have lived for a very long time, red brick buildings, immediately adjacent, uh, as I said, to the French Quarter, which is one of our uh, highest residential and tourist sections, but also immediately adjacent to Canal Street, which is much like our Michigan uh, Avenue. So it's kind of nestled right in downtown uh, New Orleans. Many families have lived there for generations. Uh, it has been a place over time where there has been a fairly high poverty rate, a high crime rate. Uh, very difficult situation for a lot of folks, and the secretary and I and a lot of other folks have tried to envision what it would look like uh, if we did something different. Uh, and I'm very excited about the partnership that the secretary and I have had. President Obama's been terrific. President Clinton, by the way, has been to New Orleans more times uh, than we can count and has been a, um, a really wonderful partner for us. For I thank him for that as well. But it's a very exciting project. It forces folks that have not worked together before to do so. It's forced the federal government and the city government to rethink uh, how they work with each other, how they talk to each other, how we break down silos, uh, if we're actually gonna make this happen. So I'm thrilled by it, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Great. Uh, Sean, you, this is really a project of building a neighborhood from the ground up. It's not a restoration of housing, really. It's a, it's a full suite project. Talk about the strategy. Talk about your experience in those kinds of projects. Yeah, and, and before we jump into that, John, I just want to thank you. And I love working with uh, one of the greatest mayors in the country, Mitch Landry. just been an amazing, amazing partner. Um, I, I also would say to President Clinton, don't stop beating the drum. Just a couple months ago, uh, we passed in the Obama administration a million home retrofits since the president came into office. And that would never have happened without the advocacy of President Clinton and CGI. It's been a great partnership. Let's get to two million as quickly as, as we possibly can. Uh, great, great work, and thanks to CGI. So I, I, the, the thing I would say about um, this Iberville project and more broadly the Treme neighborhood is, you know, compare it to the way we used to do uh, urban development at the federal level. You know, HUD was created in 1965 when our cities were burning, and the answer then was urban renewal. And what it meant was a, a group of planners would sit in Washington, D.C. and figure out what was wrong with a neighborhood, go in and kind of wipe it clean. It was almost like a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And that's why public housing looks the same in New Orleans as it does in New York, in L.A., in Chicago. And, and what's really fundamentally different here is that we went in and said to Mitch Landrieu, 
what's your vision? What's the city's vision for what this neighborhood could look like? And maybe more importantly, what are the assets in this community? What's amazing about this neighborhood, not only do you have the French Quarter, two blocks from this public housing development is the old Broadway of the South. You've got some of the most spectacular old theaters. Um, many of them had, were literally just sitting vacant. You've got billions of dollars, $3 billion in new hospitals going in just a few blocks away, huge opportunity for jobs. And so the idea here was to say, how do we build on the, the assets that are there? And how do we connect it to, to jobs? How do we think about the transportation system? We're actually rebuilding the streetcar named Desire to run uh, just a couple blocks uh, from there uh, that'll connect this, na this uh, development to jobs further away. So it was really thinking holistically, and it was, it, Mitch likes to call it place-based development. It was us following their vision of what this place could look like. And, and the last and probably the most important thing is our partnership with the Department of Education. Arnie Duncan's been just fantastic on this, along with the Recovery School District, because at the end of the day, you can do everything to build, rebuild the bricks and mortar. If you don't have a decent place for kids to go to school in that neighborhood, you're not gonna make a neighborhood that's sustainable long-term. So it really was, for the first time, bringing all the federal agencies, we got about a dozen federal agencies working on this together, but doing it not in service of some vision that we've created in Washington of what a neighborhood ought to look like, but saying, what, what does New Orleans want to be? What are the assets that are there? And bringing the pieces together to serve that. Go ahead. Can I, just a, and the, the secretary did a spectacular job kind of scoping that out, but I want to I back into it. Uh, the, the original kind of idea was, you know, things are not working really well uh, in government. How can we make them work better? What's wrong? Well, a mayor runs up to Washington, D.C., I've got to go see the secretary. I run down the street. I've got to go see the secretary of education. It gets really hard and complicated to go try to find a way to piece together. And everybody knows that the silos in the federal government, well, they're on the local side, too. So what we talked a lot about, uh, and the president created a plan as a result of it called SC2, how do we get the executive branch of federal government and the executive branch of local government in the same room at the same time talking about the same thing so that we can create a better delivery system so the government could be more effective. And that's kind of where the idea of, of this started. And then it got down to uh, the secretary saying, well, again, we don't want to tell you what to do. Why don't you tell us what it is that you need? And then what we will do is, instead of just rebuilding houses, now he's the secretary of housing and urban development, right. but he started talking about building communities. And if everybody, uh, all you got to do is go down on the street and say, look, what, what really makes this a place for people to live? All right, it's not just a house. You've got to have a grocery store. You've got to have a transportation mechanism to get there. You have to have a school for your kids to get educated in. You've got to have a health center for them to get treated in. You have to have a commercial development for them to work in. So how can we identify uh, who owns all of those assets, whether it was government or the private sector, put them together, right, come up with a comprehensive plan, ask everybody to come to the table with the residents really informing us about what to do. And if we could coordinate all of that stuff, what kind of brand new environment could we create? How many jobs w could we create? And really, could we in fact create a sustainable community in that place? That was kind of the big idea. Iberville Treme is, an, is just an example of a neighborhood that's trying to use that approach that's very different because I think all of us know now we're in a different age. Government's getting smaller. There's less rather than more. And so what we have to try to do is facilitate, communicate, right? Link together all of our assets, leverage them, and then create something that maybe we didn't think about before, and it's forcing us to do really pretty, pretty neat things uh, on the ground. We were talking backstage about the challenges of reducing youth crime, and you've done a good job, your crime rate's down, but is, is it necessary to have that kind of approach in order to tackle all these social problems that are... Well, I, I think that it is. I think there are a lot of great things that have gone on in the city of New Orleans and in other cities, in Chicago particularly, but one of the things that continues to plague a lot of major cities is um, you know, the violent crime rate. Uh, particularly murders uh, in America. We need to take a look at it. Uh, you have a lot of kids being shot on the streets of America, and it's something that we have to work on really, really hard. Uh, obviously, if you don't have healthy communities that, that children live in, they'll grow up to be unhealthy, uh, and they'll make bad choices, and the consequences are going to be dramatic uh, for all of us. It is really a catastrophic problem all over America. We have it more than they have in other places, and, and we're working on it very hard. And this is something we recognize, and Mitch had really pushed for this, the old model was you want to redevelop your public housing development, you come to HUD, we might give you a grant there, 
you want to do the school, you go over to the Department of Education. You might get, you know, a year later, um, Department of Transportation, you want to bring back the streetcar. Well, there's a separate process. What, what we did is the White House organized a neighborhood revitalization initiative that brought all of these agencies together. And now what's happening with the Choice Neighborhoods grant is they automatically get access to the, per, the Burn Criminal Justice Initiative, which helps create community policing, funds that. It, it's like a one-stop shop that allows it all, all these pieces to come together. A community health clinic that can be funded through the same uh, initiative. We, we've modeled something after the Harlem Children's Zone, uh, which I worked a lot on when I was in New York working for Mayor Bloomberg. And the Promise Neighborhoods Initiative Arnie Duncan has put together is also part of this, so that you can come in and do these pieces together rather than having to sort of put it together all yourself from the ground when that's it's sort of this maze of, of bureaucracy in Washington rather than really brought together for for the to serve the neighborhood. This is a model working in cities across the country. A absolutely. And in fact, the, the the next generation of it is what uh, Mitch described. He called it SC2, strong cities, strong communities. We actually took 25 different people from 13 different federal agencies. We embedded them in Mitch's office, uh, like literally in his office. I, I used to work for Mike Bloomberg. He created this bullpen. You know, his 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 desk is about the size, his office is about the size of, of this, surrounded by all the other cubicles. Everybody hated it at first, but what it's done is to create communication. And the way I knew this was working, we had all six mayors that are part of this Strong City, Strong Communities effort up at the White House the other day. And they started picking out in the audience of this theater the federal employees that are working with them in their offices. Now, I'll tell you, Mike Bloomberg didn't know the single name of a federal employee in New York City. I can guarantee that. <laughs> Every one of these mayors said, and that's Sarah Ray, who runs my, my team, and she's the best. And then Mitch said, no, 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 I got the best team, and you're right over here. And, and so there's a real sense of knowing each other and figuring out how to work together in a way that is just very different uh, from the old model. So some of it is not just assets. You know, a lot of us go to the federal government and said we need more money. This is about making the government that we have with the limited resources that are available more effective and coordinating it so that the assets get to the ground at the same time. So if you're planning a neighborhood, right, you got to make sure that the, that the bus line is going to be up and operating when the housing unit gets finished. If, if it's not there, you've got one piece. If you have to wait four or five years, you know, and you build it a piece of that's not the way you build neighborhoods anymore. And so one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that just like you would plan a private development, all of the assets, whether they're coming from the public sector or the private sector, are actually part of a much larger plan, right, that delivers the product on the ground at the same time. So when the house or the home is built, the school down the street is actually finished as well. The teachers are hired, the curriculum starts, the recreation you know, facility is up and operating. And that's what is so exciting about this particular model that we're using. It seems to be working very, very well. It takes a lot of work. As my grandma would say, a lot of elbow grease, a lot of meetings, a lot of communication problems that have to get cleared up that can get cleared up if you're sitting across the table as opposed to taking plane trips up to Washington and having, you know, siloed meetings from um, department to department. Mitch, there's been a lot of interest in the, in the CGI annual meeting in New Orleans, post-Katrina, rebuilding it, a lot of commitment there uh, that has developed uh, from these conversations. Give us a sense of what the, uh, what the overall project's like. How's the restoration going? What's happening there? Well, first of all, I want to, you know, on behalf of the people of New Orleans, thank all of the people from around the world and from America for, for investing and caring enough about New Orleans. It's one of the great cities of all time, as you know, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. It deserves to be saved and has a lot to offer. Uh, we're making great progress on completely changing the structures uh, of, of the, the kind of the foundational institutions. The, the, the education reforms that have gone on in New Orleans, I think by anybody's standards, uh, would be considered really great. Um, we're way ahead on health care reform. We have ADA primary health care clinics now uh, delivering care to 350,000 people where folks used to go to the emergency room at the O Charity Hospital. Uh, I think you see a lot of movement on infrastructure. You see a lot of movement on government reform. Coastal restoration. Uh, and sustainability is something that's really important. We're a coastal city. Uh, by the way, most of the people in America live pretty close to a coastline. So I'd pay attention uh, to you know, rising sea levels uh, and global warming. That's something that you ought to be concerned about. But we're really thinking about building a city that's sustainable over a very, very long period of time uh, by protecting ourselves with new building codes, uh, new levy protection, and of course, restoring the coast, which is, continues to deteriorate, by the way, uh, at 100 yards every 45 minutes. 
Uh, and if you want to protect the, the energy independence of this country, protecting the source of energy, most of which comes through Louisiana, I would consider as a national imperative. So we keep working on it. We're making great progress. Great. Proud of you. John, I would just add, first of all, it has been such a boost to our efforts to have, have Mitch there. And I think what I, what I particularly appreciate about what he's done, I would say uh, just about the time that he came in, um, we really, he, he, he moved the, the rebuilding there past rebuilding. And, and what I mean by that is, look, this idea was not to rebuild exactly what was there. I mean, there were 10,000 vacant homes in New Orleans before the storm. And what he's done is to, is to create a vision of something that is revitalization rather than just rebuilding. And in particular, I was with Walter Isaacson a couple nights ago who grew up there, um, and he was saying, you know, the civic culture there now, there's an engagement of the average citizen in New Orleans in a way uh, that is stronger than anything he remembers growing up there well before the storm. And I think Mitch has had a lot to do with creating a culture of, let's not stop at just rebuilding what was there. Let's go beyond that to the city sort of on the hill that we all could, uh, could imagine and wanted even before the storm. That's great. Uh, Sean, the clock's run out, but I'm not going to let you get off the stage without asking one last question. Home values finally went up 2.5% uh, or 2.3% in the first quarter uh, this, the, in the first quarter of uh, 2012. Uh, have we hit bottom? Are we on our way up in the housing market? That's the first time home values went up since 2006. Since we've run out of time, I'll just say yes, John. Uh, Excellent. You heard it here first. No, <laughs> to be serious, and look, we got, a, we got a jobs report last Friday that reminded us that recovering from the deepest crisis any of us has seen in our lifetimes is not something that happens overnight. It's not a straight line. But uh, between home values that are now not just up first quarter, but two out of the three national indices show year-over-year uh, -year increases, the first time we've seen that since before the crisis. We've got the best uh, home sales numbers through the, the winter and the spring that we've seen since before the crisis started. And the last piece is, you know, the number of families falling into foreclosure is about half of what it was when the president came in. Now, Having said that, there's much more that we can do. We just, the Housing Recovery Group that's been part of CGI has done some great work. We just announced uh, today an innovative new thing that we're going to do in selling FHA loans to try to help neighborhood revitalization, keep more families in their homes. The president's got a plan he talked about in the State of the Union to help Americans refinance. We got the lowest interest rates in the history of the 30-year mortgage right now. Usually it's a huge macroeconomic boost. We haven't seen that because so many families are underwater and haven't been able to, to benefit from those rates. We've changed that for government-insured loans. We want Congress to move to do that for every kind of loan. Those are just a few of the things we can do to keep building the momentum. But Thank you. we turn a corner. Thank these two great leaders. Really a great conversation. Thank you, John. Thanks, man. Thank you, Mr. Secretary.